a special guest, um, in addition to um, the Dean of the College of the Arts, um, Dean Merrill, um, who's going to get us started. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Great. Thank you, Heather, and welcome, everybody. Uh, so before we get started, I'd really like to, I think it's very important that we acknowledge and give thanks. Uh, so the College of the Arts would really like to acknowledge our presence on this traditional ancestry and unseceded territory of the Gabriel Nino Tongva nation. Um, we pay our respect to these indigenous caretakers for both the past, the present, and the emerging. Um, so thank you for letting us use this land. Um, I also want to thank Mariana Pomonas and Heather Denier for organizing and putting this together today. Uh, this is a, a long time uh, in the making, making this happen. And I want to thank all of you that are participating here today. Um, um, thank you for coming. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we acknowledge uh, people that make a, a, a huge difference. And when I was a young artist, uh, I saw, it was very odd, that the higher up I went in the dance field, the fewer and fewer uh, women leaders there were. And that was something that I really set out that we need to change this. And I think we need to change this in all the arts, um, that this really that there's equal representation of all people, but uh, really the underrepresented and of course, uh, women being uh, one of those underrepresented groups. So this is a good start to that. And um, thank you, uh, Mariana and uh, Heather for uh, leading this conference today. So Heather. Thank you so much, Dean Merrill. Um, so the way we're going to do things today, we're going to have three um, student presenters and one respondent, who's Kelly Gerard. Um, then we're going to have two more student presenters and two respondents. Um, Louis Bernard and Caroline Heldman. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers from um, everybody attending. So our first presenter today is Jennifer Birch, who is representing the theater and dance department here at Cal State Fullerton. And she is going to present on sexual violence in theater and society. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Heather. Okay, let me just share my screen. So hi, I'm Jennifer Birch. I am a theater student here at CSUF and I will be presenting some of the research I did last semester on sexual violence in theater and society, particularly on how Jacobian and Elizabethan theater shaped the Western view on sexual violence and how we still see it today. Before we get into some examples, I'd like to share some etymology to some important words. Uh, the word rape comes from the Latin raptus, which means abduction, forced coitus, and sexual assault. Massacre is also another important word. Its Latin etymology comes from the word macella, which is the act of butchering. Um, in this sense, it refers less to the butchering of animals for sale and more to the destruction of heavily injured bodies. It is important to link these words together because often in historical context, massacres are described like rapes. Uh, in the play Alarm for London of 1602, the character Sancho de Vila describes the invasion on Antwerp as follows. And therefore she must spare from forth her store to help her neighbors. Nay, she shall be forced to strip her of her pouches and on the backs of Spanish soldiers, hang her costliest robes. What patient eye can look upon yon turrets and see the beauty of that flower of Europe and in it be ravished with the sight of her and beckons us unto her sportful bed. I want to make it explicitly clear that Davila is talking about a city, not a woman, and yet the way he describes Antwerp is as a woman asking to be invaded, to be massacred, to be raped. And the importance of this link is because sexual crimes such as rape during the 16th and 17th century were an issue of property. The rape is not only a crime against her, but against many. According to the Law's Resolutions of Women's Rights, a London document published in 1632, uh, female victims of rape had a specific way they had to report it in order to be believed. She must lament her suffering while shewing her wrong by offering up her garments torn. Essentially, she must have physical proof of her rape, and immediately after it happens, she must escape to trustworthy men and show them this proof, 
all the while performing her upset. If she doesn't do this, she is not going to be believed. And while it is not written down, the protocol afterwards was for the woman to take her own life. She had to rape the shame brought onto her father, her family, her husband, her village, and her country. The rape isn't hers, it's all of theirs. And the only way to get rid of the shame is to stop living. This is why rape is a massacre and even more so a theatrical process. We can look to theater of Elizabethan and Jacobian times to see this even more and to understand why these protocols were put in place. Sexual violence on stage was not only common, but popular at this time. One of the most famous examples of rape in theater is that of Lavinia in Titus Andronicus, a play written by Shakespeare between 1588 and 1593. In Titus Andronicus, Lavinia is out with her fiance when a pair of brothers kill him. They then rape Lavinia, cut out her tongue, and cut off her hands. Despite having been silenced and disfigured, Lavinia still performs the theatrical act of declaring her rape. In order to tell her father what has happened, she has to put a phallic cane in her mouth and write the names of her rapists in the sand. She is actively experiencing the rape again through this process and following the steps of the law's resolutions. Later on in the play, Lavinia is killed by her father because that is the only way their family will get rid of the shame. Another example of this is The Changeling by Thomas Middleton and William Rowley, a play published in 1622. In The Changeling, Beatrice Joanna is engaged to a man she does not love. She hires another man named Flores to murder her fiance in order to escape her fate. De Flores asks that Beatrice Joanna compensate him. She thinks this is a monetary exchange, but it isn't, it's sex. Although the text clearly states that this is a rape, many still question how consent works in this play. Just because Beatrice Joanna is a bad person who commits murder, it does not mean she has to consent to sex or that she deserves sexual violence. Some readings of this play imply Beatrice Joanna consenting and falling in love with De Flores as a quote unquote sexy version of Romeo and Juliet. And she is often painted just as badly as De Flores as the two are regularly coined as lovers meant for each other. These plays have shaped how rape victims were viewed then and now, creating the two types of victim the world deems women to be. One is Lavinia, an innocent and tragic soul destroyed by the rare evils of the world. The other is Beatrice Joanna, the lying whore who deserved it. If not a virgin, one is usually considered a Beatrice Joanna. Either way, victims are still often asked to perform their trauma. The representation of sexual violence matters because plays that give us our Lavinia's and Beatrice Joanna's create this atmosphere into a reality, when we know it is much more complex than that. By looking at this, we can see how the Western world continues to perpetuate the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, we'll save questions and answers until after all of the presentations. So our next presenter is Rob Heisman, who is going to be presenting on Adrian Piper. Rob is from the Department of Visual Arts. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, Heather. Give me one second so I can share my screen. Make sure everything's good to go and we shall begin. Hello, my name is Robert Heisman and today I'm going to talk about American conceptual artist, philosopher and educator, Adrienne Margaret Smith Piper, who throughout her career has focused on racial discrimination through self-reflective work in a multitude of mediums. Piper has had a long and successful career that has included more than just art. Obtaining her doctorate to be a philosopher, she currently teaches at Wellesley College in Massachusetts. In 1987, she became the first tenured black woman in the field of philosophy. Piper was born September 20th, 1948 to mixed parents in Washington Heights, New York. At a young age, she was taught to draw by her grandmother. She would have her first encounters with racism while attending a predominantly white private school called New Lincoln School on scholarship. Growing up as a light-skinned black woman in a predominantly black community, Piper faced adversity for her light skin as she received nicknames such as Pelface. 
She also experienced racism at New Lincoln School since her peers were not fully aware that she was black. Myra would go on to have a very prestigious educational career. She obtained some formal arts training at her AA from School of Visual Arts, New York in 1969. She would go on to study philosophy at City College of New York, where she received her bachelor's in 1974. She would then receive her master's and PhD in philosophy at Harvard University. As a young adult, Piper lived through the Civil Rights Movement and the Women's Liberation Movement, two extremely large events that no doubt had a heavy impact on her work and thought process going forward, as her work speaks heavily on these issues. Piper's work focuses on themes of otherness, ostracism, racism, and racial passing, all topics that are pertinent to her own personal experience. Much of her gallery work incorporates text and imagery like Vanilla Nightmares 2 and Decide Who You Are, juxtaposing African-American imagery with the harsh words and realities they face. Piper says, Blacks like me are unwilling observers of the forms racism takes when racists believe there are no blacks present. Sometimes what we observe hurts so much we want to disappear, disembody, and disinherit ourselves from our blackness. Our experiences in this society manifest themselves in neurosis, demoralization, anger, and in art. Throughout her illustrious career, Piper has received many awards most recently being the Golden Lion for Best Artist in 2015 at the age of 67. She had been included in 14 exhibitions, her first being in 1969 and her most recent in 2018. Her work is currently in the collections of the Art Institute in Chicago, the Met, the MoMA, the Walker Art Center, and the National Gallery of Art. Her first series was Catalysis in 1970. Piper conducted street performances in which she altered her physical appearance and demonstrated antisocial behavior to explore gender and body issues, to examine the roots of prejudice and bias. She would appear in public in clothes that smelled or were sticky with white paint. During these performances, she would study people's reactions. According to the University of Chicago, Piper transformed herself into the mythic being by donning an Afro wig sunglasses, and mustache, and adopting behaviors conventionally identified as masculine. She then explored how she and others responded to the mythic being. In the process, she transformed the conceptual art practices common in the period, infusing them with strong personal and political content. In Exaggerating My Negroid Features, Piper has drawn a self-portrait that focuses on her, quote, black features. In this portrait, she captures how she views herself as a black woman, despite how she is perceived by the public, which is white passing. Funk Lessons was a performance piece in which Piper literally gave the audience lessons on how to listen and dance to African-American working class music. This work challenged a preconceived notion that all African-Americans have rhythm and confronting white cultural discomfort of black popular music and its African sources. Since Piper was white passing, many people would inadvertently say racist remarks around her. She would hand out these calling cards, essentially calling them out politely, ending them with, I regret any discomfort my presence is causing you, just as I am sure you regret the discomfort your racism is causing me. Cornered is a multimedia video installation that features a television screen positioned in a corner behind an overturned barricade-like table. The installation sits down viewers and has a one-sided intellectual conversation with them. The conversation addresses what it means to be black and challenges viewers to come to terms with their own black ancestry. Adrienne Piper's legacy, not only as an artist, but as a woman of color, is as important now as it has ever been. Despite the long journey she has had creating art that speaks to these tribulations, America's racial climate is still nowhere near the tolerant and empathetic society that Piper strives for. Piper sits on the crossroads of gender and racial marginalized groups, something that the art world has greatly underrepresented. It is important that we keep their legacies alive and we continue to learn, educate, and add to a lacking Eurocentric curriculum.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Our next presenter for today is Marina Avalos, who is presenting on Barbara Jones Hogu. And Marina is also from the Department of Visual Arts. Thank you, Heather. I'm just going to take a second to get this going. All right. And here we go. To find out how a man behaves and how he will probably behave in the future, you have to study history. Yet the history we seem to grow up learning erases and trivializes the significant and impactful contributions of minorities as well as their torment and strife. As we celebrate February as Black History Month, we cannot forget that Black history is history. Confining the learning of an entire culture ingrained within the foundations of this country to a mere 28-day period diminishes the significance of Black contributions and also allows the greater truth to be erased. Only by telling true stories do we have a chance to eradicate not only racist behavior, but racist thought, something that seems to be prevalent now more than ever. So today, we will learn the story of a woman who dared to challenge those that threatened to deny Black people their right to spreading truth. My name is Marina Avalos. As a member of our tiny community in this amazing Art 3D2 class, I would like to present to you the artists I chose in commemoration of all the strong, empowering Black women that shaped our history and our desire for change. Today, we are going to learn about Barbara Jones Hogu. I'd like to touch base on a small introductory spiel regarding the artist and also briefly explore a little bit of her life story. It is important to note that her background is rooted deeply into the era that she grew up in. Her history and association with the time she lived in had a deep impact on all of her amazing work, which we will see in this presentation. Barbara Jones Hogu was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1938. She earned undergraduate degrees from Howard University, where she studied teaching, and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. At the Art Institute, she majored in painting, drawing, and printmaking, resulting in exploring and taking courses in various methods of woodblock, wood graving, etching, lithography, and screen printing. In her studies, her interest in printmaking was deepened, and this love for printmaking is what would flourish into her drive to create vivid, awe-inspiring art that challenged the stereotypical representations in the Black community. Jones Hogu is more closely associated with the Black arts movement of the 1960s and the 1970s. The Black Arts Movement, or BAM, was the name given to a group of politically motivated Black poets, artists, dramatists, musicians, and writers who emerged in the wake of the Black Power Movement. Although the Black community made momentous strides in equal rights legislation during the 1960s, racism and behavior accompanying it was still prevalent. Through activism and art, the Black artists of BAM created a cultural institution and conveyed a message of Black pride and rejected older political, cultural, and artistic traditions in order to create politically engaged work that explored the African-American cultural and historical experience. In 1968, Jones Hogu helped found Afrocopra, the African commune of bad relevant artists. In relation to the Black arts movement, Afrocobra was a group of Black artists based in Chicago whose shared aim was to develop their own aesthetic in the visual arts in order to empower Black communities. They were compared to the Black Panthers of the Civil Rights Movement, but rather than bringing about change through political revolt, these artists used the Black identity, its style, attitude, and worldview to foster solidarity and self-confidence. Afrocobra sought to create a revolution of the mind, body, and spirit, and their art reflected this statement. Jones Ogu's work centers around the issues surrounding Black stereotypes. Before the formation of Afrocobra, her works were informed by a largely negative narrative in the context of racial politics. However, her individual work shifted and took on a more positive, hopeful narrative after she became more involved with the Black arts community through Afrocobra. She wished to display more positive issues in her politics, and this was a philosophy also echoed by her cohorts. In a documentary about Afrocobra, she remarks that the people we are making art for look like us. Jones Ogu's prints showcase powerful political statements and multiple layers of color to complete her complicated compositions, which were centered around themes of liberation, freedom, and unity. She was adamant on including messages that empowered Black people in her work, oftentimes including stylized words in her prints or phrases such as take back control, unite, resist, relate, or Black men, we need you. For her, the use of words was to ensure that her message was direct and
I think Marina's um, screen might have frozen for a second. Uh-oh. Clear so there was no room for a debate on what she was trying to convey. Her signature use of lettering in her artwork became a hallmark of the Afrocobra aesthetic. In 1968, Jones Ogu would create one of her most famous works while involved with the Afrocobra, titled Unite. This work was inspired by the 1968 Olympic Black Power Salute, in which two African American athletes, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, each raised a black left fist during the playing of the U.S. national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. In this print, African elements include the Afros and the Ankh, an ancient Egyptian symbol in which one woman wears. These symbols provided a shared source of identity that compelled many to dedicate themselves to the freedom struggle, or as Jones Ogu urges, to unite. Her print, Stop Genocide, was based on what she saw as a self-genocide of black gang violence. Jones Ogu thought that the gangs could be used as a force for good if they came together, but gangs were too occupied with killing each other to see that the issues they fought one another for were the ones they needed to fight united. A white-dominated society that tried to erase or trivialize black issues was one of the driving forces behind the self-genocide, when the goal should be to stop genocide entirely within the black community. Among the most prolific works of Jones Ogu is her famed Wall of Respect. In 1967, Black visual artists associated with the organization of Black American culture and created the mural named the Wall of Respect. This awe-inspiring mural was made in support of the grassroots movement for African American civil rights in Chicago. Barbara Jones Ogu was among the artists who painted a section of the South Side building, pictured in the slide, to commemorate African American heroes, musicians, athletes, and political leaders. Though more additions were made to the wall of respect in 1969, after a 1971 fire damaged the building on which the mural was painted, the entire structure was torn down and thus the wall of respect was destroyed. Barbara Jones Ogu's impact is a deep resounding one, still empowering her community through her work even after her death in 2017. Her work is so powerful both aesthetically and politically. Even 50 years after the civil rights movement, her work continues to resonate with a lot of the social concerns today around racism and oppression. It is crucial that we learn of women like her and continue to let their messages make their path through time, and therefore, I thank you as my audience for allowing me to speak of her. I hope that we may continue to learn about artists such as Jones Ogu to continue to spread the truth of our history. Thank you very much, Marina, and thank you, Jennifer, Marina, and Rob, for presenting such great presentations. Um, I am going to um, add to the chat for everybody the program, which was created by another student, Kimberly Young, so that you can follow with where we are. Right now, we're going to ask our first invited guest to respond to these three wonderful presentations. Um, this is Kelly Nicole Girard, and I'll just introduce her briefly. She is an award-winning playwright and founder of the OB winning The Fire This Time Festival, a groundbreaking new play festival for black playwrights, which is going into its 12th anniversary 12th anniversary season. Um, she has also served as a guest lecturer at Yale School for Drama and Stanford University's theater department. She is a 2008 graduate of Columbia's MFA playwriting program, and her work has been developed and or presented at the Atlantic Theater Company, Sheen Center for Thought and Culture, the Fire This Time Festival, Harlem Nine, Primary Stages, and the Classic Theater of Hartman, uh, sorry, the Classical Theater of Harlem, among others. She is currently completing The Fire This Time's first anthology of plays, um, so look for that in the future. And she recently published an essay um, entitled About Alice, or When Social Distancing Ends, which was published in the Flash Paper, Theater's Thoughts on Right Now, and also in American Theater Magazine. And I'm going to provide a link for that so you can all read it in the chat. Um, but without further ado, please um, join me in welcoming Kelly Gerard to respond to the first three students. Thank you so much, Kelly. Hello, Heather. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm going to apologize for two things in advance. One is that my um, four and six year old are down the hall. And um, even though they are locked out, they will find a way in um, if they need to, as kids do. Um, and the other is that I am um, I am so overwhelmed with thoughts and responses to your presentations that um, I'm, I'm going to try to um, make sense and not get too excited and so um so but if i but if i just start to to ramble uh you know um maybe someone can just uh step in and try to redirect me um 
Uh, so I, I first, um, again, um, I can't thank you enough, Heather um, and Mariana for um, inviting me here. Um, one of my favorite things um, to do as a part of the fire this time is um, mentorship. And we've had so many um, uh, students come to the fire this time um, while they're still in grad school or right out of grad school. And, um, and, and, I, and I just am uh, just so electrified by their perspective and their and their um, their their thoughts and their creativity and um, and and it's amazing and so I am um, uh, not surprised um, to to feel the same way um, after hearing um, your presentations and um, Jennifer Rob and um, Marina thank you so much for your um, beautiful and thoughtful presentations um, you know I was writing things down as I was going through and um, you know I think. For me, a through line between each presentation is just the um, uh, how performance is so vital if you are coming to this world as anything other than a straight white male. Um, performance uh, is necessary for survival. And now I feel like we're finally at a point where performance is starting to uh, become a way for us to uh, get back to who we are. Um, and every single presentation, um, you know, um, I, you know, I, I, I am, uh, I'm uh, responding to these presentations at a, at a very uh, pivotal time for myself, um, and that I will make my 39th birthday on Saturday. Um, but also in this past year of um, pandemic and lockdown, um, you, I found myself in a space where you cannot escape yourself anymore. Um, and uh, so much of the um, issues that were brought out in each of your presentations were things that I uh, directly um, dealt with being a woman of color and being a mixed race woman of color. And, um, uh, and I robbed so much of your presentation about Piper resonated with me um, because I have all throughout my life have been mistaken um, as, a, as a white person and growing up in uh, Louisiana. Um, was always many times privy to people, a white person thinking that they were sharing a sentiment with me, you know, um, and not knowing that they were talking to a black person. Um, and so it was just uh, for me thrilling to know that somebody else has gone through that. Um, uh, but I wanted to kind of start with, um, with Jennifer's presentation, just um, talking about um, this uh, performance of, um, <laughs> of, um, sec of, uh, how our um, womanhood, our um, sexuality has to be um, performed in order for us to believe it. And how far have we come away from that? Because the first thing that came to my mind was a couple of years ago on the campus of Columbia where Heather and I attended school, there was a student who would walk around with a mattress on her back. She had to perform her Assault. She had to. She had to include something performative in order to be taken seriously, um, and so it sent chills down my spine to for for you to be giving that presentation and knowing that we're still there, um, you know, and that um, you know. Uh, I, I I was also um, thinking about your presentation very much in terms of um, you know one of the, our most famous theater pieces. Uh, to date, a streetcar named Desire, and how when I was in college, there was the biggest debate about that play was whether or not Blanche, um, uh, Blanche was raped, whether or not she wanted it or she didn't want it. And it was not a question of, there was a spectrum of sexual assault. Our expectation is that she should have, you know, she had to fight and she had to claw and because she moans that meant something, you know. Um, and so to, to, again, kind of like still be having these conversations and that that scene with, with Blanche is still up for debate is, um, is, is so telling about um, where we are and our, um, and our um, acceptance of, of our expectations of, um, of how people pr present themselves. Um, and that we don't see uh, people as individuals, but as a set of, um, ideas about how a person is supposed to behave, um, which then goes uh, seamlessly into Rob's presentation. Um, and I'm just, um, I, you know, um, the performance of race, <laughs> um, you know, and for, you know, um, 
Piper dealing with the triple consciousness, maybe even a quadruple consciousness, honestly, of being mixed race, but being a woman, um, you know, and be, being a black woman and, um, and all of those um, interse intersections, I um, have very much been at the place where she was where, um, you know, you are too black to be white, too white to be black, you know, Black people have preconceived notions about how you're expected to behave. If you know, if you're choosing <laughs> your blackness, um, white people have an expectation about how you're supposed to behave if you're choosing your blackness. Um, it's a it's a space where you can feel like you cannot win, um, and um, the the way that she kind of delved into that, I thought was so fascinating. And I also thought there was one other thing that uh, note that I made, and I said, why don't I know who this artist is? Why is this the first time that I'm hearing about her? And um, that thought for me goes very, um, uh, goes into Marina's presentation where she says black history is history. Um, we have compartmentalized um, our, um, the, the experience of storytellers and the experience of artists um, into uh, different months because we've had to, because otherwise it, it would only be known to, to, to us. I mean, I say a lot um, as a woman of color, um, I know my history and then I know white America's history. Um, you know, a, a, a couple of years ago when I was at the Sheen Center and I uh, programmed um, watching a documentary about Emmett Till. And um, so as I'm doing a, um, a, a, a promo for it, I'm sitting next to a Fox News correspondent and he's in his forties and he did not know who Emmett Till was. And it blew my mind, um, you know. So, um, so, uh, so, 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 yeah. I, I, so, I'm, I think about that a lot, and I, and I'm thinking about, you know, how performance, how performance, again, um, has been such this tool of survival for us. But that, um, you know, as now, like moving into like, you know, Rob and Marina's presentation how performance and how art help us get us back to ourselves. Um, that it's not just about literally trying to pass so that we can get better opportunities or trying to just, you know, um, keep our heads down and step off the sidewalk if a white person is coming the other way. And all of these like ritual performance things that we've let, that people of color have just learned to do throughout um, history that literally put watching ourselves on stage, um, watching ourselves in the art, you know, the way that um, uh, in Marina's presentation that, that, that the, that the beautiful artwork, I mean, it's just so stunning. Um, you know, how we get, finally are getting an opportunity to be able to see ourselves. Um, and, um, and this is uh, very much, I think um, uh, these three presentations, I mean, there's no way you could know how personal these would be to me. Um, but uh, these were all, everything that you all touched on in your uh, presentations were reasons why I um, founded the Fire This Time Festival. Um, the Fire This Time Festival, our motto is as simple as this, anything written by a black person is a black expression, even if it's about two white people in love. And that is because the play uh, festival was founded out of the frustration I mean, I was sick and tired of being, you know, um, you know, what race are you? Or what are this? What like there's conflict had to be a box, and I'm just like, no, all like this is blackness. I'm writing a, a, a romance about a, um, a about two white people. I mean, I've never actually done that, but if I wanted to, um, you know, uh, that is a black expression because it's my experience. You know, um, we've gotten way too comfortable with saying that, you know. Uh, your experience is X, Y, and Z. <laughs> um, and the wonderful thing that I love about what happens in this festival every year is that you can't guess what's coming across the stage. You can't, because it is that individual's expression. It is that, that they're storytelling their experience. And I'm getting to encounter them for the first time. And it is going to be, um, you know, th there's this term that's like, you know, called uh, diversity within diversity. And um, it is true, but it's also just like, um, it's humanity within humanity. <laughs> I mean, um, humanity is diverse. You know, the way that one person responds to sexual assault or responds to um, being a mixed race person in, in uh, moving through this world or responds to, you know, being a, 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 a black artist, you know, from Chicago, that is very specific to who they are. That is their humanity. 
Um, and and uh, we are all, <laughs> um, just by virtue of being individual humans, that is, di it's diverse, you know? Um, so um, I, I am just, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so, um, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed by your presentations. Um, it's um, these all hit incredibly uh, personal things for me, and um, and uh, I am excited to have met um, two new artists um, through Rob and Marina's um, presentations. And um, and again, you know, I say for someone who has been steeped in uh, black art and culture and storytelling for so long, how are there still artists that I'm missing? Um, but I could tell you all of the most famous um, European composers, you know, I could, I could tell you, know, like all of those things that I, that I learned and was ingrained with and that, um, you know, um, uh, storytelling, I do believe, um, is our way forward. Um, this, the storytelling through art is our way forward. Um, I, 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 and I'm, I'm going to try to close my presentation because I could say so much, Heather, um, by saying that, you know, when, um, when a lot of things were going down, like over the, you know, I, I'm just going to say over the past four years. Um, and um, there were a lot of the um, high profile killings of, um, of innocent black men, um, you know, and people were, uh, I, I, or I'll say specifically in the arts world, after the killing of George Floyd, when there was such an outcry in the arts, in the arts world, and there was a lot of backlash, people were finally just saying things. Um, there was a huge upheaval, um, you know, at least in the theater world. And, um, you know, someone said, um, or I remember a sentiment that was, you know, it's like, uh, there are more important things going on in the world, you know, why are we worrying about this? And I'm like, this is everything. This is everything. We tell the stories about what someone, about who George Floyd is. So by the time you encounter someone like George Floyd, you already know him, he's dangerous. You know, he's not worth your sympathy. He's not worth anything. You know, someone was told that through a story, you know, um, we pass down these ideas of people in the same way that we pass down stories. It's like oral tradition, you know? Um, and that's why the stories are important. Storytelling, humanizing people, having a, um, a, a vast representation of experience is our way forward. If, if, if as long as you do not know that that child and that uh, mother um, suffering on the border have a story, they're not real to you. And so, um, and so that's why that's why it's important. So I uh, personally am just um, I'm incredibly inspired by you all as the future of our um, of our uh, uh, of our culture and creativity. So thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, I'm just going to post the program in the chat so that you can see where we are. And um, Mariana, off to you. Hi, thank you so much, Kelly, for really summarizing and, and summing that up, the, the first three presenters. That was really eloquent and very moving. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to present our next two uh, student presenters. Uh, first up is Eileen Gonzalez, and she's going to be presenting Marsha P. Johnson. Now, Aline had an exam today, so um, she was called into an exam from another course. So she may not have signed on yet. So I'm gonna check to see if she's here. Um, if she's not, then we will uh, have Nikki Barcott go first and then uh, see if Aileen has signed on today. But I do have a copy of her presentation on YouTube so I can play it as well in case she, she doesn't leave the exam uh, in time to present. So. Nikki, she's not here. Why don't I just go ahead and have you present and then we'll get that'll give her a little more time in case she does sign on. Okay, that's fine. Let me just get set up and I do apologize if I uh, if my presentation lags a bit because my internet has been a little bit weird all day, but hopefully everything goes smoothly so well, Let me mute myself. Hello there, my name is Nicole Barracat, but you can just call me Nikki. This is going to be a presentation on Patrice Coulors, who is an artist and an activist. So this presentation will hope to adequately cover Coulors' involvement in the creation of the Black Lives Matter movement and hashtag, as well as her artwork being deeply rooted in issues regarding racial injustice and feminism. 
So let's start with the Black Lives Matter hashtag, which I believe a lot of people will be familiar with. Kalors is the mastermind behind the phrase that has changed the world, empowered many, and outraged an equal amount of individuals. Black Lives Matter. In 2013, it was about damn time somebody well-versed in the impact of racism on a population put people's frustration into words through this very hashtag. And this supposedly controversial stance on human rights issues serves as a very telling reflection of Kalors' work as an artist. So for some background on Kalors herself, she grew up in the Los Angeles area and was an activist from a young age, taking an interest in creative theory and revolutionaries while advocating for social justice. Kalors also harbors an LGBT identity, which had her forced from her home at age 16. She studied at UCLA, earning a degree in religion and philosophy. She also received an MFA from USC. Kalors co-founded the Black Lives Matter movement with the help of friends and fellow activists in response to the shooting of Trayvon Martin. The hashtag itself would officially surface in 2013. The 2010 saw rise to many BLM protests in relation to the unjust deaths of black men and women. Martin's death would be followed by Eric Gardner and Michael Brown in 2014 most notably. The peaceful protest reignited with tremendous support this past summer, following the once again unjust deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. As Kalors is a woman and an activist, she will consequentially fall under the feminist label. But the issues she advocates for are, at the end of the day, feminist issues, as well as human rights issues. In relation to BLM, arguably the group at the highest risk of violence, brutality, and unjust murder are black trans women. This melds BLM to the LGBTQ plus movement and feminism as a concept whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. Furthermore, Kalor cites one of her primary inspirations for her activism as Audre Lorde, a woman with a black, queer, feminist take on issues. Regarding the major themes that Kalors exhibits in her artwork, her work tends to put a particular spotlight on black issues and activism involving the unjust incarceration of minority groups in America, prison reform, and protest against police brutality coming from a very personal perspective. A memoir written in reflection on the BLM movement and activism, pictured right, was cited as a magnificent accomplishment by the Times Literary Supplement. Kalors also began a YouTube original series in November of 2020, titled Resist. This series is ongoing as of writing. An appearance by Kalors was made in the 2016 documentary Stay Woke, the Black Lives Matter movement. Now let's take a brief moment to look at some of Kalors' artworks. This photograph is from her piece titled Respite, Reprieve, and Healing from 2019. In this photograph, she is submerged in a bathtub full of 400 pounds of Epsom salt. Considering that activism is an exhausting 24-7 job, this performance piece is inspired by said exhaustion. Putting a spotlight on black performance artists taking an important moment to look after themselves. This photograph here Now let's this photograph here is from her performance piece titled Prayer to the Iyami, dating from early 2020. Donning angel wings made from her brother's old clothes, symbolic of her fight to keep him safe from incarceration, this versatile piece puts a spotlight on prison reform while reflecting Kalors' spirituality, in addition to serving as a love letter to the Los Angeles area and a loving prayer to her brother Monte. In conclusion, this f in conclusion, Kalors and her work is proof that, without a doubt, the BLM movement will almost always coincide with feminism and LGBTQ plus issues. 
because feminism is not true activism if it excludes black women, and LGBTQ plus pride cannot be true pride without including queer black individuals, especially trans women. No movement can truly call itself an advocate for social justice and human rights if it excludes the importance of black lives. Thank you so much. That was beautiful, Nikki. Um, and I'm going to go ahead. I don't believe that um, Eileen has uh, logged on yet. I'm going to go ahead and just play her YouTube video that she sent to me last night. Hopefully she'll do well on her exam and uh, show up towards the end so she can hear some feedback. Uh, Marina is presenting Marsha P. Johnson. Hello, my name is Eileen Gonzalez. I'm a Black female identifying artist I'm choosing to present today is Marsha P. Johnson. In this presentation, I'm going to introduce Marsha P. Johnson and speak about her background, talk about Stonewall, some of Marsha's activism, performance work, and some other accomplishments Marsha did. When asked what when Marsha was asked what the P stands for in her name, she always answered, pay it no mind. She would also answer this whenever people would ask her about her gender. Marsha Pay It No Mind Johnson is one of the most iconic trans activists and she did so much in her lifetime. And Marsha P. Johnson was born on August 24th, 1945. She is one of seven children. Marsha is also a black trans woman who identified herself as a drag queen. Marsha once said, I was nobody from Nowheresville until I became a drag queen. She was also a performer and was very involved in the gay rights movement. Around this era in which Marsha was doing most of her activism work, homophobia was running rampant across the US. Many LGBTQ plus members were being targeted by the police force and there was a lot of violence towards them. One of the events in which Marsha B. Johnson was known for being a part of was the Stonewall Riots, which was a police raid targeting the Stonewall Inn, which was a popular gay bar and the patrons started fighting back with the police force. One of the major things that Marsha advocated for was for gay rights. Marsha once said, you never completely have your rights one person until you have all your rights. Marsha believed that all LGBTQ plus members should have equal rights to love and get married. She also was against the police brutality that LGBT members faced. Marsha was a performer by nature and performed with a drag troupe called the Hot Peaches. She also had performances that were comedic and political. Marsha was not known for doing high fashion drag as she was not able to afford more expensive clothing, but she was always seen wearing fresh flowers because she would sleep under a flower sorting table in the flower district of Manhattan. While Marsha was performing, she also accomplished many things. Through Marsha's activism, she became very politically active in her community. And shortly after Stonewall, she was co-founding member of the Gay Liberation Front. She was also a part of the Drag Queen Caucus. And one year after Stonewall, walked in the first Pride Parade, first Pride Rally. Alongside co-founding the Gay Liberation Front, one of Marsha's project was co-founding the activist group STAR with her friend Sylvia Rivera. The name STAR stood for Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. After a couple of years, they started to ban drag queens and trans women from Pride as the lesbian and gay members believed that they gave Pride a bad reputation. The way Marsha and Sylvia protested this was by walking in front of the Pride Parade. Aside from doing demonstrations, STAR also tried to find housing for homeless, trans, and gay youth. Marsha P. Johnson was also featured in Andy Warhol series, Ladies and Gentlemen, which was a series of featured trans wonder women, and most of these women were women of color. Although when Andy Warhol was picking his models, he was mostly picking from random women, Marsha radiates through these picture photos and show how much beauty she brought into this world. To conclude this presentation, I just want to say thank you to Marsha for fighting for the rights of people to love whoever they want. Our first pride was a riot and Marsha was one of the people fighting on the front lines. We should remember Marsha P. Johnson's name and celebrate her life.
So thank you. Eileen, hopefully we'll be able to sign on and hear some of the responses to her work in just a minute. Um, thank you so much, uh, students from Art 82 Art and Social Justice, and um, Jennifer for presenting on sexual violence in the Jacobean Theater. Um, it's a real honor to be here with you today. I want to take a moment to um, thank Caroline Hellman and Lily Bernard for being here today. Um, we've learned a little bit about your work, and so the students in my class are very excited to meet you. Uh, Caroline Hellman and Lily Bernard are activists, artists, that, and organizers that helped end the statute of limitation on rapes in California. Um, when people ask me who's the face, fam most famous artist I know, I always say Lily Bernard because her work has touched more lives than any other artist I know. Um, and I say that with true sincerity. Um, and she and Caroline are just an amazing tour de force as friends and collaborators and incredible artists. Their performance-oriented protests and public appearances in state government offices have led directly to inst institutional change in their time. They've continued to work and organize for ERA Now and many different organizations that advocate for women and people of color. Dr. Heldman is the Vice President of Research and Insights at the Gina Davis Institute for Gender and Media and a professor at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Her research specializes in media, the presidency and systems of power, race, class, gender, disability, age, and body size. Lily Bernard is a visual artist and actress who has most recently shown her work at the Museum of the African Diaspora. Bernard is a graduate of social practice program at MFA, program at Otis College of Art and Design. Uh, Bernard is the founder of Habla, uh, harvesting our Asian Black Latino artists to provide platforms for underrepresented artists in Los, in Los Angeles. She later also founded Baila, Black Artists in Los Angeles, a current movement aimed at building bridges of access for Black artists in the mainstream art world. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here today. And it's such an honor to host you and Kelly as our distinguished speakers today. Thank you. It's a joy to be here. Hi, Lily. And wow, these student presentations were amazing. Do you do you want to start? Do you want to start us off? <laughs> I'm very emotional right now from the presentation. So I'm gonna let you go, CC. I call her CC because um, that's a nickname for Comandante Carolina. And um, when we <laughs> drove in carrot vans up to the state capitol on numerous occasions to testify before Senate and council hearings, we kind of had fun with it and we gave ourselves these little nicknames as soldiers. So she's Comandante Carolina, known as CC, and I am Lieutenant Lily. LL. So go ahead, CC. All right. So. Um, and thank you for that incredibly uh, warm introduction. Um, so one of the themes that, yeah, emotion, I, I'm very, very emotional after seeing these presentations because these are not stories that are often told, right? And I apologize. I have a codependent cat who's just gonna be here. Um, so the, the first thing that, that jumps out at me is um, the, the theme that ties these two things together really well is that you have a lot of, so, so you're focusing on intersectionality and social movements, right? And intersectionality is a term that, that we're familiar with Kimberly Crenshaw coining in 1989, and she should be given a lot of credit for that. And also Patricia Hill Collins, who came out with a book a year later, um, who coined the, the matrix of oppression, but it's the same thing. But really this all started back in 1830, right? Um, with a book uh, by Mary Stewart, which was the first intersectional analysis. And then the Combahee Collective um, was a, a group of intersectional essays explicitly calling for intersectionality without using that language um, that preceded uh, Crenshaw by you know, a decade. And so, and this is all to say, um, you are addressing something that is, um, so intersectionality is the idea that you have interlocking or overlapping systems of oppression. And this is a concept that's been around since the early 1800s. Um, and what ends up happening in movements on the left that fancy themselves as being very progressive is that they always inevitably leave various groups out, right? And so when you're talking about the struggle with Patrice uh, Couillors and uh, Marsha P. Johnson, you're really talking about the liminal spaces that they occupy um, between being in the movement for social justice for what they're advocating for and then being marginalized within that same movement, right? And so this theme comes up with Patrice and talking about her, uh, you know, being, being uh, a queer woman, um, being a black woman, 
uh, being a woman, someone who brings these intersections in and then creates a global hashtag, right? But then we also have the campaign that came up a few years later that was spearheaded by Kimberly Crenshaw, Say Her Name. The reason that you have to have a Say Her Name campaign is because you know, black women who are being murdered by police are not being included in the equation. And then also I would point out, and, and certainly you touched on this, Nikki, um, just to build on this, this idea that, that she ends up being ex in some ways not given the recognition like the, the most prominent men in black, the most prominent activists in Black Lives Matter are generally not the three women founders, all, all of whom are queer black women. And so you see this erasure of their contribution, you see the erasure of uh, intersectional erasure of black women in the movement. Um, and this is something that Patrice, you know, she, she, her art brings this pain up, right? It brings the pain of multiple erasures up and, and raises awareness of that. Um, and then, of course, Marsha P. Johnson, you see the same thing that the, her uh, extensive, ex she, so she's literally embodying a challenge to socially constructed gender, right? Through her middle name, as you point out, Eileen, right? It's, it's a great, um, you know, I, yeah, don't, don't even bother. I don't fit, don't even bother asking me, I don't fit your categories, right? So this, her, her body becomes living art to challenge the gender binary at the same time that, you know, I, I just think about her, her contributions being erased in the Stonewall film, um, where she was actually the one who uh, initiated uh, the, well, the Stonewall riot, uh, the term riot is so loaded for me, especially when a black woman is inspiring it, right? We tend to call thing, we tend to call social movements and, and pushes against injustice riots um, if people of color are engaging in them in marches or protests, if, if white people are engaging in them. Um, but I think that the thing that really ties this together is uh, that both of these artists inhabit multiple intersectional identities and they have experiences, um, unique positionality within these social movements and are pushing back against their erasure in the broader culture, but also pushing back against their erasure in the movement itself. <laughs> they were amazing presentations, Lily. Are you are you less? How's how's I'm, your emotional reaction? I'm so moved. Um, Caroline knows me well. Nikki said it was about damn time. <laughs> Did you hear her say that, or that them say that? Excuse me. Did you hear Nikki say that? It was about damn time. I just love that. And Nikki also said that activism is an exhaustive job when they showed us the photo of Patrice in the Epsom salt. So I wanna, I, I guess I wanna talk about the emotional aspect of this and on an interpersonal level. Caroline is also an emotional person and a very sensitive person, but I'm gonna take it um, straight to the emotion. So you saw Sylvia Rivera, right? And um, there's a video, have you shared, Marianna, have you shared the video yet that I shared with you of Sylvia Rivera at, um, no, that's our next class, actually. I was waiting. I thought you might want to talk about it a little bit first. Okay. So I, I'm trying to, I'll try not to give a spoiler alert, but in that 1973 gay pride parade that you showed a picture of, so Sylvia Rivera it's, uh, uh, was trying to get to the stage to talk about uh, the pain that she and her colleagues, her peers, her trans peers experienced, for example, in the industrial prison complex, where they are being raped really uh, systematically and where there is no help for them and, and, and the horror of that. And when she's trying to get up to the stage on multiple times, she's just rejected and booed and, and finally they let her on the stage. And while she's talking, they're still, you know, jabbing at her and booing at her. And then when she gets off, it, Mariana, there's another clip that shows the whole booing. So not the one that I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. So you'll see her booed and she's being Food by predominantly, you know, white gay cis men, and she, he is, she, here she is, an Afro Latin trans woman trying to get a very important point across, and that was so emotionally traumatic for her. So for her, having been someone, of course, who was rejected by her family, right, and then rejected by her own LGBT community, raped in prisons, and she's trying to get up there and speak her word, and she's being rejected by gay white, mostly white men. Do you know what she did after that talk? She went home and she tried to kill herself. And then Marsha P. Johnson intervened 
And then later Marsha P. Johnson was murdered, right? And then later Sylvia dies of cancer. So these are the, um, this is a great emotional impact when it comes to being an activist that when you see Sylvia up there, you know, in the, the, the in that um, talk that your, your teacher is going to share for you, when you see her fighting all these, you know, racist, really transphobic, gay white men, she seems so strong and she's just yelling and you're like, yay, you know, you know go Sylvia, go Sylvia, not Marsha, sorry, go Sylvia, go Sylvia. And you're just like reading with her, she's like badass strong, just up against these, you know, these mean white gay men. And then, but to know that she went home and tried to kill herself just shows that there's this great vulnerability. There's actually this power and strength in your vulnerability, but that we are humans, we activists are humans. And I'm gonna tell you that when I opened up this thing and when, who was it? Someone gave the talk, I loved it. Um, who was the, your student who, oh, where is, what was it, Jennifer, Jennifer Birch. When Jennifer was giving the etymology of, how do you ever pronounce that? Etymology, help me pronounce it, of oh, the, the root of the word rape, rape and massacre. Um, and then she just kept saying that word. I was getting freaking triggered. I was like, oh my God, am I going to be able to get through this talk? Because it was just, and she did a phenomenal job presenting and it was very important information. And she took it way back to the 1600s with the rape laws and then Artemisia Gentileschi, who's a feminist Baroque painter who inspires my work. You, you, your teacher will teach about that. That's too much to go into, but Artemisia Gentileschi learn about that Baroque painter, rape survivor, and she painted her rapist's face in a painting of herself decapitating her rapist. I appropriated that into a slave narrative. But there's a, a really emotional element when, when you're being an activist, you have to be so strong to transform your trauma into triumph for the benefit of the you know the greater good the community and um and so i just wanted to to, to touch on that um let me see so eileen gonzaza marsha p johnson so I, I mentioned that but but i don't know i just what i, what I the reason i mentioned nikki first with the it's about damn time because that was like a, a really emotional powerful comment and i think it was beautiful it was raw and real and yeah nikki it's about damn time because this shit is exhausting it's exhausting to keep fighting patriarchy. It's exhausting to keep fighting misogyny. It's exhausting to keep fighting homophobia. It's, it's, but, so you have to be so strong and so resilient. And so that's um, where I'm coming from. And I, I just really admire your professor so much. Caroline and I represent, Caroline and I and Marianne and I represent a dynamic that's a very sensitive issue. Like just as there are these, um, like these intersectionalities that you're talking with. And the, Caroline calls it what the oppression Olympics. Isn't that what you call it? Like who's, yeah. who's more oppressed, right? Hands right well, hand yeah. She, she can talk about it, but like, you know, I'm black, Latin and Chinese, that's me. And when I started hanging around white girls, I didn't really start hanging around white girls until I came public about the Bill Cosby trauma that I suffered. My black and Latin friends were like, when they see me hanging around Caroline, like, oh wow, you hanging around white girls? Now look, I'm freaking 50 something years old. And my black female friends like, oh, you hanging around white girls now? You know, like I'm, like I'm betraying them, you know? But as it turns out, it's really against the status quo of our culture as black, Latin and Asian women to speak out against rape. It's just, we, we don't do that because we're constantly having to try to protect the black male image or protect, you know, the Latin image. So to actually call out our rapists, you know, when nine times out of 10, your rape, rapists tend to attack in the same demographic group. So we're, we find ourselves having to protect our perpetrator, but we represent this dynamic that does prove that, that yes, um, rape, racist, rape and sexism, they do cross socioeconomic boundaries. They do cross cultural boundaries. But there's this, there's these, my friend Tanya Pinkins made a movie called Red Pill, look for it. It's at uh, Pan African Film Festival right now, Red Pill. It deals about these issues, but um, there's just so much more that really brings us together than what separates us, you know? Because when you look at the differences between you know, the girth of our hips or the girth of our nose or the texture of our hair or the, you know, the, the level of melanin that we have. I mean, there's just so many more other things that that are different than us or that, that are the same, you know? Like we all beat with one heart. We all have the same color blood. We all have, most of us have two eyes and two ears and two nose and 10 fingers and 
that why do those few little things have to separate us? I mean, history, right? So I don't know, I was just coming from like an emotional perspective. And I just think you students are so blessed to be able to discussing this. When I was an undergrad and when I was in graduate school and I just graduated from graduate school in 2014, nowhere did I have anywhere near this kind of subject matter. I mean, in art theory class, every single philosopher whom we were made to study was a dead white man. And so the fact that you are you know, that you, are, that you are learning and discussing all these great arts. It's a real travesty, I've said this before. It's a travesty that art academia does not provide access to its students, uh, to, to, the, to the wonderful breadth of knowledge and creativity and power and intellect that is art made from communities of color. It is a travesty. It is nothing but white supremacy. That's all I have to say. Well, that was a, a very powerful, let, all you have to say statement, Lily. And Lily is an incredibly passionate speaker, an amazing actress, um, amazing activist. And um, you know, thank you so much for, for talking about it. I know it must have been hard for you to, to hear some of the presentation today. I appreciate you, uh, you know, sticking with us and, and giving your feedback to the students. Um, and this, the research that the students uh, conducted was really inspiring, I have to say, as their teacher. And I think that Heather will agree with me. Um, you know, when this was just an idea last semester and we weren't sure, you know, how it was going to work. So this is this is the first time we've done this on campus. And I want to thank the students and everyone here for, for helping us make it work today. Um, we did open up the Q&A if anybody has a question for any of the panelists or any of the students. Um, there is one question that's up right now that I should ask. Um, and I'm assuming that this question is for the visitors. So we'll start with Kelly and then do Lily and Caroline. Um, and the question is from Hannah Nguyen. What inspires you? It's sorry, Mariana, you told me to. Oh, I'm sorry, which is, oh, the question is from a student and the question is what, is what inspires you? And I'm assuming she's referring to your practice as a, an artist and a writer. Um, I, I'm honestly, um, I, I think the, the way to answer that right now is that I think, you know, what in, um, I, I, I am uh, right now um, incredibly inspired by the um, untold stories of uh, my people from Louisiana, my uh, Cajun Creole people. Um, it's a black experience that is um, uh, not very, um, it, it is not seen. There are stories that are not told. We have deep roots, um, deep rituals. And um, uh, the, 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 I am also inspired by the urgency to tell these stories because um, my home state is uh, gonna be one of the first uh, states to be um, affected by climate change. We, our um, coastline is disappearing and with it are um, a lot of our rituals, our language. Um, so I'm inspired right now. Um, I'm always inspired by storytelling, um, but I'm inspired right now by the urgency to tell this, uh, these stories of the black experience. Awesome. Willie, did you want to go next? Yeah, I, I'm a lot like Kelly. I'm inspired by my Afro-Cuban uh, culture, but I'm also mixed. You know, I'm mixed. Uh, the Caribbean in me is half of it is Jamaican, uh, but I was born in Cuba. But I come from a family that has really deep historical roots in terms of Cuban liberation against Spain. History is a huge inspiration for me. But because I have six kids, ages 12 to 23, um, youth, youth are a huge inspiration to me. And really, my children are probably my greatest teachers. So um, I uh, am very inspired by the youth, particularly my own children and by history. I would say that uh, I'm, what inspires me is encapsulated in a quote from an artist, an Aboriginal uh, Australian artist, Lilla Watson, uh, who I'm sure you've heard this quote, if you've come here to help me, then you are wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with my liberation, then let's work together. So there it is. And Kelly, um, I'm working on a documentary on the Katrina murders and also curating a new civil rights museum in New Orleans. So we should talk because obviously we are inspired in deep love of New Orleans and deep love of your state. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm fighting for my own liberation through the liberation of others. Awesome. 
uh, we have a couple more questions. Well, this one first is, a, is mostly a comment and then we'll get to the next question. This is from Marina Avalos. I honestly am so grateful we're learning and discussing black artists. I feel so much of what I learned growing up has been uh, so whitewashed and it was only until I took art history classes and attended university that I finally had a grasp of how much was completely glossed over. Uh, we don't learn about minorities and how much they were and are a huge contribution and a part of our history. Uh, and it's honestly appalling. I only wish I'd learned about it more growing up. Um, and then this is a question from Malia. Do you have a piece that you are most proud of um, that you feel exemplifies your message the loudest? And so let's just go in the same order because I like that. That was nice <laughs> that we knew. Kelly? Sorry. Um, yeah, gosh, that's such a wonderful um, question. Um, I would say that um, in the past, um, couple of years, um, I, um, I, I got a commission from the Atlantic Theater to write a piece and I decided that I was gonna dedicate that commission to finally writing the story about my um, grandfather who was a, um, a traiteur or a, uh, a, commu or a healer, a faith healer um, in, um, in a, a cage, a Creole and Cajun Louisiana. And um, uh, I think the reason I'm most proud of having completed that, um, that play was that because my, both of my parents grew up um, French Creole and their first language was French, um, they were embarrassed by their culture. Um, you know, my, my, my father became a doctor. Um, they, I felt like they fled poverty, but what they also fled was everything that made them who they were. And so, um, you know, we were not taught French. We were not taught about our, um, properly about our ancestors. And so I got to go back and, um, and hear all those stories and, and learn all that language and, um, and learn about this incredible faith healing culture um, and come to find out I'm actually four, four generations of healers now. My great grandfather was a healer. My grandfather was a healer. My father's a doctor. My siblings are doctors. I'm married to a doctor, but that happened by accident. <laughs> so, so I, I'm so I'm most proud of that piece, just for being able to learn more about myself and my history. Wow, and I, I love Kelly calling doctors healers because that's what they are, you know. And 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 God bless the doctors on the front line. Um, right now fighting the battle of um, coronavirus. So was the question, the piece you're most proud of? What was the question? Most yeah, do you, have a, do you have a piece that you are most proud of that you feel exemplifies your message the loudest? The loudest, loud, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got a piece right here. I'm looking at the screen. It's, it's in the other room, but it's big, you know, it's like, six feet wide and five feet tall. So I can't bring it in here, but I got a picture of it on my iPad. The loudest, okay, there's a freaking castration happening in this. There's a decapitation happening in this. And um, so I'm gonna do a little trigger warning. So this is the painting that I mentioned. I have, a, it's, a, it's within a series of very large muralesque kind of uh, paintings that I make that are called, uh, I call antebellum appropriation. So clearly the black figure is quite absent in the annals of art history. And as you know, the annals of art history are predominantly European history. So if we ever see a black figure, it's like maybe the maid bringing flowers to Olympia, right? In uh, the classical European painting by Manet or whatever, you know, very seldom. So what I do is I take these iconic classical European paintings and I sort of own them by flipping the switch, right? Flipping the script, uh, flipping the narrative and inserting enslaved characters into the narrative to show that, hey, look, you, know, you can't erase this history. It is the enslaved population of African people who sustained the lifestyle of those beautiful white figures on canvases. And, and they don't appear in the museums, but it was happening and slavery was happening, not just transatlantically, there was slavery happening in the continent of Europe. It was happening. You know, so Velasquez, a very famous Spanish painter, his apprentice was a slave. You know, and this was happening during the cross Atlantic slave trade. So I'm going to show you the work. And why I love this painting is it's just, it's so raw. It shows the emotion. So uh, my character is the pregnant woman, mulatto. I'm what you call mulata in, in, in Cuba. 
And um, she would have been raped a lot. So she's wearing a skull's bridal. So the skull's bridal was a real metal contraption that had like a, like a spoon, which was sometimes fork, which pressed down on the woman's mouth. And white European men used this scolds bridle, you know, to punish their nagging wives. And sometimes the bridles had bells on them so that wherever the woman, poor woman would go, there'd be bells calling attention to this metal bit on her bridle. And then of course they used it for the slaves, right? Whenever the white masters would rape the slaves, often they would put on these bridles so that the slave woman couldn't, you know, scream for help. But, um, so Atimishi Gentilis, she's painting, which your teacher will tell you about some other time. It's called Judith Slaying Holoforns. That's the one I mentioned where she actually makes herself rape, I mean, dec uh, dec decapitating her rapist. When she was put to trial to testify whether or not she really was raped, because this rapist was also like her fiance in an arranged marriage. Her father was a famous painter. It was her father's apprentice. They actually like put her fingers in vices in the trial and like squeeze them really tight to see if she was telling the truth. So she's like, I'm going to retaliate. And so her painting was a great feminist expression. I'm talking like 16, what was it? 1650 or something like that. She died 1650s. But this is my painting. Let me see if you can see it. Oh, Jesus Lord. I don't know. It's not, so see that? And uh, there's an Orisha in there. An Orisha are Yoruba deities. And this Orisha I love, Oya Yansa, because as you can see, her colors, um, her favorite colors are the colors of the rainbow. And then she's so badass that when she goes to war, she grows a beard. So she would be a great LGBT icon, the Orisha Oya Yansa. So that's probably the loudest, most passionate work I'm proud of. And that was part of my museum um, solo exhibit at Museum of African Diaspora. Uh, can I take this opportunity to highlight my favorite piece of Lily's work? Sure. I mean, I have many, many favorites, but I just wanted to share my screen. At the Cosby trial, Lily came up with the idea of honoring each of the survivors with a, a bag that has the year of their assault, but something very specific to them. So you'll notice that all of these bags have different symbols on them that relate specifically uh, to something in their life or their story. And so, uh, sorry, Lily, I know I just kind of put it up there, but this is, um, this is some art that in the service of activism, just, you know, it's heartbreaking. And it sends a really important message about not only, you know, the fact that there are so many survivors of this one predator, but also that each survivor is an individual with her individual pain and experience of that pain many years later. Yeah, thank you. That is a really powerful piece. Both of those pieces are really powerful. And Lily's an incredible painter. You can find a lot of her work online if you just Google her name. And then a lot of her um, acting resume will show up as well um, because she was a cast member of The Cosby Show um, and uh, a part of that very famous trial um, and an activist for all of us, which is uh, some of her, I think, uh, sort of um, all of her work is profound. And I think that there's a tie that links all of that together um, that's transforming her experience into this very strong political statement in the paintings and in the performances and in the installation work. Um, it's great to have you here. Um, this is a question from Nicole. Um, as Kelly mentioned earlier, some of these artists and activists may not be known to many people. Um, how can we amplify these voices and art this is for everyone, anyone really, a student, panelist, anyone have any suggestions about how we might be able to do a better job as an institution? And you know what, Marianne, this also kind of couples with Caroline's question um, to, to the students of how you're going to use this experience, this knowledge um, towards your, your work in the future. I did actually give an answer to Caroline's question. Would you guys like me to read it out, if that would help? Yes, please. So the question was essentially, how do you see this opportunity, I imagine, informing your future work? Now, I will say that my life and art in general has always been politically charged by social justice because it can't not be. I'm non-binary, I'm Arabic, and I'm on the autism spectrum. So I'm pretty underprivileged in a lot of ways. Being able to speak on this topic with the level of professionalism that this opportunity has granted me has been a privilege and I am 
always looking for ways to educate myself with new resources and enrich my artwork with a perspective fueled by proactive knowledge. Like I'm going into animation and representation is very important in the entertainment art field. So I'm hoping to definitely bring some of that there from a very well-informed perspective. And I honestly think that everything can be improved with positive representation and the whole story. Um, so I do see this as a positive outcome for my future work. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Um, what I plan to take from this experience is, you know, just letting it it, it validates the fact that the things that I care about um, in producing theater are valid. Um, I've really cared about this subject for seven years since I was 14 when I was assaulted. So, and it's, for me, it's completely linked to theater. Sexual assault and theater is linked for me um, because that's where my assault happened. And I find my power and my art through uh, using that to um, make a better future and to hopefully make something that people can relate to. Um, so that's how it works for me and how I plan to use this. And I also just know that it's validated. <laughs> so yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, piggyback on what Jennifer was saying. So I'm also in the um, Screen Actors Guild Sexual Harassment and Assault Committee, right? We meet regularly and we, we discuss these issues about people, for example, being like, Jennifer, I'm very sorry that you went through that, that being assaulted um, in the realm of their thespian career as were you, as was I. And um, but my, I, I've been thinking a lot about my, my friend, Tanya Pinkins. She's a Tony Award winner. Her film, uh, The Red Pill, that is out now in, P, in uh, the Pan-African Film Festival. She's also a sexual assault survivor. And there's a very powerful scene in the film. I'm trying, gonna not try to spoil it, it for you, but you can see the film for $8 on the Pan-African Film Festival website, Red Pill, where there's a gang rape. And, um, and you don't really necessarily pay attention to the cropping, you know, the framing of the, the film, because you're just, you know, so horrified. And the second time, and I had to ask her, like, how did she stage that? How was that not triggering? Because in the in our sexual harassment committee, the Screen Actors Guild committee, that we talk about issues of um, like, we have um, intimacy coordinators on the set, right? So the intimacy coordinator's job is to make sure that that people are not being assaulted, that there's respect, that everything is choreographed. So she said, because from her perspective as a sexual assault survivor, that she had chopped off all the heads in the scene. They're all, so there's a, a bunch of men raping this one woman and all their heads are chopped off. So you don't see them. And she said that that was a creative artistic choice, of course, because it's not about the individual raping. I mean, it's a much greater, broader system, systemic problem. It's like, you know, it's, it's institutions, right? Because slavery is an institutional. It is, like I have said many times, it is, the linchpin of colonization. It is the crime that has been used to disempower populations of brown and, and black people and women. So she decapitated everyone. And then the beauty of it uh, from, the, from the creative perspective is that the person who was actually raping the girl was another woman dressed as a man. So that provided the actor a sense of safety that there was, you know, there's no penis there that could possibly be bulging and she could feel this comfort. And she felt during this, during the filming that she felt that that woman who was portraying a male rapist was actually protecting her from the other. So that's, so these decisions and these choices that we, that, that, um, that we make. I just wanted to piggyback on that. So as a creative, there are choices that you can make that will provide um, a certain statement toward the public, like the decapitation, you know, of the rapist. And then also, um, a commitment that you can have for the actual artist, the performer, to try to make them feel safe as they are enacting this crime of rape. I just wanted to say that. Um, also, I just wanted to, to say, um, Marianne, I, I, I just really wanted to thank Jennifer for sharing that. Also, for Lily, um, 
and uh, uh, Lily, we, I, I knew we had a connection because Tanya is one of the, my dearest collaborators. In fact, she will be starring in one of my plays <laughs> um, next month. Um, and, um, I, you know, um, I, I, uh, I think, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, what we'll take from this. I think, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, for, for me, um, I mean, I've only uh, been doing the Fire This Time Festival for 12 years. Um, that's the, it's 12 years and I'm already exhausted. I'm already exhausted of having to do all of the work for the institutions that have the money and the uh, power to do it. And this past year, when you know every theater institution all of a sudden realized that they weren't programming enough people of color or enough women or enough LGBTQ people, all of a sudden they wanted to start having conversations with me. And I made it very clear to them that, um, you know, if I choose to have a conversation with you, this is the way in which we will proceed. You will talk about the resources that you have and we'll talk about the resources that I have and we'll talk about where we can intersect, but you are not getting anything for free anymore. Um, and I, I think what I wanna to convey to, to you all as you are going into, um, into the world and you're talking about the things that you care about, um, you may be tempted to uh, feel that you need to be representative of, uh, of your experience. Um, I have often at the admin level, um, because I've you know, done so much producing, have been the only one in the room. Um, having to educate white people, uh, having to come up with all of the programming for diversity. And, um, and I think in my last position, I couldn't even take it anymore. I, I, I literally just, I, I took the whole thing down. I took the whole thing down because I couldn't take it anymore. Um, I told them exactly what they needed to do. Um, I just got to a point where I was not afraid to say what needed to happen. Um, there needs to be more. Uh, 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 diversity at the admin level. Advocate that your um, uh, your colleges, your institutions, your art, the cultural institutions um, have more diversity on the admin level. Advocate that people go ahead and you know and retire and make room for someone else. Um, and don't ever think that you're doing a favor or you're being a team player if there's only one of you in the room. You don't have to stand up for everybody else's uh, experience because other people choose not to be educated. And I promise you that they'll act like they care and they don't, because if they did, they will listen to you. And that's all I want to impart. <laughs> yeah, there's a question here that's really, I mean, you answered it beautifully without even reading the question, but it, the question is from Katie is, what is your opinion about the Black Lives Matter movement that happened last year? I mean, you, you answered that really clearly, which is that suddenly people showed up and asked, but that it, that your experience before that was before that. There, it's always been here. Um, and it's just people, some people waking up to it, but it's been an experience that your lived experience. Um, so thank you for that. And also, um, Kelly addressed Adam's question of what is the advice, the best life advice you can have um, towards moving forward um, um, uh, that you think would be valuable for others to gain insight, new, pers new perspectives. And I think Kelly already addressed that. Um, but if anyone else wants to um, add to that in terms of advice, in terms of Black Lives Matter, in terms of incorporating all this work um, in, in art education, um, then maybe that's a great way to end it. If anyone has any final words in the discussion. Uh, yeah, I would like, just like to say that um, to create art for yourself, there are going to be so many people who are so privileged by their race, by their gender, by their status, who are going to tell you what they think of your work from their limited perspective. And they may demean you and make you feel like you're totally irrelevant listen to your heart uh just learn to like reject whatever you know is not right and just to plow through with what is your truth you know as kelly knows in i think it was hamlet act one scene three shakespeare polonius says to his son laertes this above all and this is part this is the um the program the aa program uses this right the 12-step program this? Okay, I'm quoting a white dead man. Oh, forgive me. See, hey, you know, I mean, 
I'm enculturated. Okay, I'm quoting a white dead man. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow like the night, the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. I think we all need to do snaps now. Thank you everyone so much for a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you everybody for participating. Um, just really, really great moment. Um, take care everyone.